continuing on with bacteria <clears throat> and their um, kind of some general things about it and then their classification here. So uh, take a second, stop the video, um, take notes on uh, the different classification and we will go through the classification a little bit more, but um, you'll need to know all of these groups. All right, so the bacteria, um, just to kind of continue on with some of their feet, some of the features of bacteria, um, they, their nutritional modes. So what we're talking about here is we're talking about, um, you might, and again, you might remember talking about this in quarter one, autotrophs versus heterotrophs. Autotrophs are using inorganic, um, compounds. So, uh, for example, carbon dioxide would be an inorganic compound. Same thing with water. Uh, to make organic compounds, and those would be mainly sugars um, of some sort, uh, that is things that contain carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. So autotrophs are going to be um, doing that, and they generally uh, can either use light or they can use other chemicals like hydrogen sulfide, for example, uh, to as their energy source. So as those things break apart, um, then they'll use the energy for that. So these are called chemoautotrophs, otherwise they're photoautotrophs. Um, both of them use carbon as their main source of um, the, like the carbon base of organic molecules. And um, of course, photoautotrophs are photosynthetic and um, chemoautotrophs can be things like, uh, that might live in uh, hydrogen sulfide ocean vents or something like that or sometimes like under like under a mulch pile or something like that, along those lines. All right, so um, heterotrophs are things that use organic compounds as their main um, uh, energy or carbon source. And they can either be photosynthetic or not photosynthetic. Uh, that is, if they're photosynthetic, they use light. Um, so uh, they can, you know, use light, but they break down organic compounds as their carbon source. And chemo um, heterotrophs are uh, use organic compounds as an energy source as well as a carbon source. All right. So uh, these these guys are, you know, the typical heterotrophic uh, nutritional mode that you think of. All right. So another thing is is the nitrogen cycle. Hold on, I'm gonna try. To, you should have this in your um, in your packet, so you might want to get it out as we go through this. So stop the video and get this out. Um, the nitrogen cycle you do need to know. Uh, the reason why I want you to know this one is because um, it shows you how uh, bacteria can be very um, useful in terms of decomposition and also very useful in returning nitrogen back to the ecosystem. So it's a really important cycle, just, just you know, to say a cycle, but also um, just understanding how the bacteria can, can um, be part of the ecosystem in a big way, all right? So this has to do with, this is supposed to be a squirrel. I don't know if you can kind of see him in there. There's his eye and his leg. Uh, anyway, this part of the cycle is called assimilation. So this is where nitrogen is taken into the ecosystem and passed through the food web. Generally, it's going to be taken in by plants uh, through, via the soil and then um, things eat it. And of course, you might remember that the main organic molecule that uses nitrogen is proteins. All right, so it's going to be proteins that are both in plants and animals. And eventually though, uh, those animals are either gonna have waste products and or the plants are gonna have um, leaves that die and the animals of course are gonna die. And they are gonna be returned back to the soil via decomposition and or just waste, waste materials. Now as they're returned back to the soil, the main thing is that bacteria are gonna help break these guys down. And one of the ways that they're going to break them down is they are going to, um, uh, you know, reduce some of these big carbon uh, pieces into smaller carbon pieces. So that's actually part of decomposition and not per se part of the nitrogen cycle, although it's a big part. So some bacteria might be involved in that. Now a different group of bacteria, once things are kind of small, a group of bacteria in the soil is going to take the nitrogen compounds that are part of these organic molecules, mainly proteins of course, and they are going to turn it into ammonia 
and then um, it's going to dissolve in water that is in the soil because there is always some water in soil um, and it's going to dissolve and become ammonium so that's in H4. Now ammonium will directly be taken up by another group of bacteria so by the way this is called ammonification because you're making ammonium um, in the nitrification process, this is another group of bacteria that's going to take ammonium and turn it directly into nitrite, which is NO2, and then it's going to um, react with oxygen that's always in the soil. So the soil has oxygen and um, water in it and other gases as well. And uh, anyway, they're going to react with that and become NO3. Now this is nitrate. Nitrate is the main thing that is taken up. Uh, so nitrates in the soil are taken up by plants and pass through the food web. So this is the big part of the cycle. Now there's some other parts to the cycle that are all, can also be important. There is one part that is called nitrogen fixation. That's over here. This is where some plants or, and or some bacteria can actually take nitrogen gas from the air and turn it into nitrogen compounds that can be taken up by the food web. Either uh, one of the ones that are part down here, so if you look here, it's telling you uh, the things that it can become and or it might go back to nitrates in the soil or it might go through nitrification. It doesn't really point there, but, but it could do that. Uh, but mainly, it's taking in nitrogen gas from the air. So how does nitrogen gas get in the air? And you might know that nitrogen gas is a major part of the uh, air or the atmosphere. All right, so let's look at that. So this is something called denitrification. So what happens in denitrification? This is a situation where oxygen gas is not prevalent. And when that's the case, the oxygen that is on the NO3, or in fact it can be on NO2 too, but uh, mainly it's on NO3, is going to then be stripped off and what is left over is nitrogen gas. And that nitrogen gas will evolve off into the air and the bacteria can kind of make it for a while with the oxygen that they're getting from that. And this is called denitrification. All right, so that can be an important part of the process. Okay, so the other thing and is, is oxygen use. And you might remember going over this in core one. Again, uh, you, can, you basically have two types, that is aerobes and anaerobes. And um, obligative aerobes are ones that always have to have oxygen. Facultative anaerobes can, can use oxygen, but they can also uh, be, do fermentation, and you might remember doing yeast in the core one. And obligative anaerobes are ones that ha uh, li like live under, uh, away from oxygen somehow, like at the base of um, a, a swamp or under polar ice or something along those lines. All right, so that's oxygen use. Um, and there's differences in that in the different types of bacteria. And another thing to consider is some bacteria, um, even though they're single-celled organisms, live in colonies. And, and one, of, one of them, sorry, dog. Um, one of them is um, called Anabina. Um, and you're going to see there's a, a, another one that you might have seen in Core 1 also called Nostoc. Uh, these are just colonies of cyanobacteria, so a different uh, type of bacteria. And these are photosynthetic cells, the main, so most of the main ones are photosynthetic. And every, every now and then it's going to have another cell called a heterocyst. And these heterocysts are nitrogen fixers, and they will provide nitrogen for the other cells in the colony. So it's actually kind of a metabolic cooperation. So that's sort of interesting. All right, so let's go through the different types of bacteria. This is um, in one of the handouts also. Um, so it's showing you all the different types of bacteria. Um, and so generally speaking, we have, um, these of course are kingdoms. Uh, pro proteobacteria, chlamydia, uh, spirochetes, and then the gram-positive types, and then you also have cyanobacteria. So those are the main types. So let's just briefly go through these, um, these main types. So I'm going to also show you that there's, um, in your textbook, there's a picture of some of these types. Um, I really personally don't find the pictures all that helpful because 
uh, you know, they're, they're kind of nondescript. In other words, they are, you know, the rods, cones, or spir uh, um, spirillus, and they're all just very small and sort of like if you were to draw them, they're small and round, kind of. <laughs> um, so anyway, they're it, kind of hard to see, but these are just some examples of them in cells, so that's kind of nice to look at. So uh, check that out. Um, so let's just quickly go through this, all right? So proteobacteria, um, there's five, five subgroups. There's the alpha. Alpha are mostly cocci and rods, um, and there are some that are phototrophic, um, but most are eukaryotes. Um, a lot of them, or some of them, live in eukaryote hosts. Um, an example is rhizodium, which is the nitrogen fixer that you find in roots, and I believe you're going to be looking at that in the lab. Um, or at least you used to. All right, so uh, the beta are, are mostly rods. Um, some are phototrophic. Um, they're very nutritionally diverse. That is, they, they probably do all four types of nutrition. And um, they are the group that does nitrification in the nitrogen cycle. Uh, gamma are mostly rods. Some of them are curved rods. Um, some are phototrophic. Some also use the hydrogen sulfide gases as a um, as an energy source, and um, and that of course would create sulfur gases. So if you've ever stepped on the bottom of the lake and smelled sulfur coming up, there that's those guys. Um, some are pathogens: Legionnaires' disease, Salmonella, cholera, E. coli. These are all gamma bacteria. Deltas are um, helix uh, um, helix shaped or helical rods. Um, most of them are anaerobic, uh, they are slime secreting and they call them mixobacteria, but kind of is a term that you'll see is sort of applying to fungi, which is slime secreting cells. Um, you're going to see fungi-like organisms do that, especially the unicellular types. Um, some of them reduce sulfur, uh, some of them eat other bacteria, so they're predators on others. Um, you have the epsilon group. These have helical rods, or they can be helix or helical rods. Um, some of them are pathogens, like uh, Camp Campylobacter, which is um, blood poisoning, or Heliobacter, which causes ulcers. All right, chlamydia, uh, mainly the main uh, example of that is chlamydia, which is an STD. You might have heard of it. Um, it can cause blindness. Um, spirochetes are um, like spirillus. That's their main shape. Um, so they're helical, and um, many, some are free living, uh, um, some are pathogens, of, uh, fam a couple of famous ones are uh, syphilis and Lyme's disease. Both chlamydia and spirochetes are gram negative. So they, gram, they lump all the gram positive bacteria that are not photosynthetic um, into um, one big group, so it's of course very, very diverse. It can c include pathogens, decom uh, decomposers, free living guys. Um, there's a group that they call actinomycetes, um, and uh, those are uh, tubercul. Uh, some examples are tuberculosis and leprosy. There's a group called streptomycetes. Um, some examples are strep throat, <coughs> anthrax, botulism, staph. And um, there's some that are called mycoplasms. When these are really small and they have a very small genome, so they're kind of weird. Um, walking pneumonia is an example of that. And cyanobacteria, um, which are uh, gram negative, are, are the main photosynthetic ones. And we already talked about anabina, which is that nitrogen fixer one, but you might have might also remember Nostoc from the lab in Core One. It looked like a little beaded necklace. 